Hello, everyone. Welcome to Marteloup Church. Today, we finish up our series, eight-week series, on the Beatitudes that we've been connecting with for most of this summer. Um, Jesus' eloquent opening words, most compelling words ever spoken, one theologian said, I've said that three times now, um, introducing the Sermon on the Mount. So we finish today with Beatitude number eight. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who suffer for doing the right thing, who are willing to pay the cost for the sake of the truth, who are willing to stick their necks out knowing the risk, who would rather endure the consequences, come what may, than sell out their very souls. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the godlike life. Theirs is a way of truth-telling that echoes the very voice of God. And so today, we're going to talk about this eighth beatitude a little bit. And as I've been doing with each message in this series, in case you haven't heard me say this seven times already, I'm <clears throat> pardon, pardon me, writing a spiritual practice for each beatitude. Um, and if you want to go deeper, there's kind of a quick response and then a deeper response on any of these beatitudes or the ideas that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, just go to my blog on the church website, uh, martelubechurch.ca. And uh, we're actually, I'm thinking, we're, we, me, myself, and I are actually thinking about bringing these all together because Aaron Layton has done so many beautiful graphics each week for this series. Um, bringing them all together into a, a little booklet or something, a kind of spiritual practice, a small group study or individual study uh, that we might put together and have available to our faith community and online. Okay, so all of that. Before we dive into this week's uh, final beatitude, here again are all of the beatitudes. God's wisdom, God's profound, mysterious, beautiful words of wisdom for you. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Please join me in a prayer. Lord, of all of these beatitudes, and they all are wrapped in mystery and come contain profound truths that we can barely plumb. But, but of all of these Beatitudes, this one seems to be the most um, difficult to understand. Um, blessing in persecution, how does that work? And so as we uh, hear about it and I talk about it for the next few minutes, uh, we pray, I pray that your spirit would elucidate, clarify, bring eloquence to uh, the words so that um, all of us can, can know what you meant um, right now, right here, within each of our lives um, through these words. So uh, hear this prayer, we pray, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, the eighth beatitude. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in case you think, well, maybe Jesus didn't really mean exactly what we think we're interpreting here, that the persecuted are blessed, um, 
Unlike all of the other Beatitudes, Jesus actually goes further and unpacks this one and describes it more fulsomely and says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice, rejoice, and be glad, uh, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In a lecture given at Regent College, Eugene Peterson said, The life Jesus provides for us is a life that provokes hostility. And so, it seems more clear now that there's something about the truth-telling of Christ as it's embodied in our lives that will evoke an adverse reaction by others, by others in our world. And now that truth-telling can come in many, many forms. Uh, last weekend, Fran and I spent way too much time binge-watching an HBO TV show called Mayor of Easttown. Totally binge-worthy. Watch it. Uh, it's on Crave. Um, a compelling commentary, like all great stories um, that connect deeply, a compelling commentary on the brokenness of human nature. Everyone has secrets, everyone's living a lie, everyone's hiding from some truth or another. And what makes the show shine, of course, is the acting. It's a great story, but the acting just brings out the brokenness of human nature in such a compelling way. And the show's actually up for 16 Emmy Awards. So, a great, great series. And without spoiling it for you, um, it's about a detective whose efforts to get to the truth often evoke uh, the vitriol of others, kind of uh, evoke a persecution that comes on her. Um, in one case, when she can't solve a case quickly enough, the mother of an abducted teen um, excoriates her just with this uh, powerful vitriol, persecutes her at every turn, shames her. And when the same detective does solve another difficult case, uh, another mother um, of the perpetrator of the crime lashes out at her for destroying her life and the life of her son and ruining her family. And so this detective, whose job is to get to the truth and to speak the truth and find it and name it, um, she, when she can't name the truth quickly enough, she gets persecuted. And when she names it in a true way that's uncomfortable, she also gets persecuted. Um, and such is the risk conundrum of truth-telling, all truth-telling. It's always or often going to be offensive to someone. And like Jesus said, even the prophets, God's prophets, had to pay a cost. And I'm thinking that, like me, um, maybe some of you know what that cost feels like. You've experienced it. Um, taking the hit for saying the tough thing when no one else would. Or feeling the weight of having to be the person who's the, the bearer of bad news. Or standing up for what's right um, when no one else will and getting crucified for that. And of course, Jesus knew that place, that costly place as well, too. And while his truth-telling, as we engage it in the Gospels, is mostly in the context of talking about the nature of God and faith, um, that's the context most of Christianity over the past few centuries has interpreted this beatitude. I think it's also fair to say that the truth of the beatitude, that hard truth-telling can lead to persecution, also applies to all truth-telling, wherever we tell it, and wherever it happens in our lives. Because, of course, Jesus has something to do with all truth. Arthur Holmes, an old theologian from a century ago, said that all truth is God's truth. And he was riffing on John Calvin's idea that all truth comes from the Holy Spirit. Therefore, all truth-telling, wherever it's being told, is God's truth-telling. Because God cares about everything in life being true and real and redeemed. So whether you're a prophet in the Bible or just speaking prophetically today, 
um, it's God's truth that's being spoken in those circumstances. And to you and me, to us, Jesus says, blessed are you when you are persecuted for that because yours is the kingdom of heaven. And of course, Jesus also personally knew the blessing that came in that persecuted place, one has to assume, right? Of course he did. And more than a few times, he gives us a, head, a heads up and tells us that we're going to know that persecution too um, with the inference, given this beatitude, that we can also know blessing in that place too. Jesus says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, literally, for some of those followers who heard Jesus say those words the first time, um, literally for many martyrs of the faith throughout history, um, literally for so many people in many countries even today, then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. And if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And so yes, clearly Jesus is saying in this beatitude that a fully lived Christian life will lead to persecution. And when I hear those words and contemplate them again this week, um, they kind of hit me in two ways. Um, first, not having really suffered a lot, really suffered in any way, been persecuted, I wonder about, and it's reasonable, I guess, to wonder about the quality of my followership. You know, am I really living the life he's called me to with this relatively easy ride so far? And two, um, in those few times where I guess I know I have suffered, um, I'm wondering, have I really experienced this blessing that Jesus is talking about there in that moment as fully as a kingdom of heaven kind of way? So starting with the first concern, am I really suffering at all? And what does that say about my faith? And again, not to be spiritually uh, masochistic or to glorify suffering or to say that we ought to seek it out and if there isn't any, then your faith isn't real. Um, not true. God is against pain and suffering um, and yet it happens and he blesses us and can bless us in those places, but it's not a good thing that we ought to spiritually seek out in order to somehow obscurely or uh, obtusely affirm our faith. Caveat aside, but has my faith really, John, ever cost me anything? Now, 30 years ago, when I was just transitioning out of being a real estate developer, making lots of money into the seminary and going into the ministry, making less money, I thought maybe that was a cost that I was willing to pay. Um, now I look back and that was no cost at all, not because I am making <laughs> any more money. I'm not even close. We'll never get close. We'll never get close to halfway. Um, but uh, it's not suffering. It, it's not persecution. Um, this job and this uh, last 30 years has brought um, great things and, and joy-giving and meaning-bringing things into my life things that I, I think I may have never had had I stayed in, in the other career. I love my work. I love the creative space it gives me. I love thinking and writing and all those God moments when things come together. And I've learned uh, financially over the years to be content with less, um, which totally blows me away. 
that I could be a person who was who he was and now is who he is in relation to money and possessions. And uh, Fran and I always talk now that we're the richest people in the world and believing it, knowing we're not, but really believing it. So a huge gift, this whole ministry and calling, official calling, working for the church, has been in my life. And so then, am I missing the mark in terms of how this is being lived out? Should I be more offensive to more people, hit more potentially leading to persecution nerves? I mean, the only people I tick off are Christians, it seems. Um, social media responses to last sermon, go check them out on our uh, church webpage or any of the sermons I preached on the vaccine or the theology of masking. Um, People often will lash out at me for those things, something I said or something I didn't say. And maybe, um, yeah, maybe the only time, if, if I were to really name a time of persecution, would have been that time um, when all that abuse came, when this worldview that we're living out as a church now about engaging God everywhere, when that was just starting to happen. And there were voices at the seminary in Grand Rapids, Michigan, um, saying that this is not good, right? And in fact, this is bad in this way of preaching and engaging God in the world. And, uh, you know, people have been called heretics for stuff like this, right? And a few seminary profs getting together and rumblings happening. And it all was quelled <clears throat> and is all in the past now and forgiven. Um, but still, even that... I don't know that, that that was so stressful and feeling like it was bearing down on me and I was being caged. Um, even that never rose to the level of, of persecution. But then I thought about um, some of the more personal and intimate spiritual psychological battles that I faced. And they, indeed, uh, for me, um, because if you've been in those places, you know what it's like, they were persecution, um, just losing it and feeling under attack at 3 a.m. for an hour or two, um, watching family members suffer and wondering if it has something to do with this crazy calling I chose to pick up if I was doing something that had nothing to do to benefit the church. You know, would they, would they get off a little bit easier? Of course not. But these things, right? Or the time where I fell off my mental, the mental rails for like six months and wonder, if, if I'd be able to get back on again. That felt like suffering and persecution for the faith. And those times before that, plumbing the depths of depression. And I've often wondered, you know, were I to have done another less directly working for God, speaking this vision and uh, about his kingdom into the world this way, would I have gotten a pass on, on some of that suffering? And again, yeah. Definitely not, right? Um, and besides, had I avoided, avoided those times, how, how would I have ever have known the, the blessing of being met and comforted and saved out of those persecuted places by God had, had I not been there? Whenever I've been persecuted, I've never been alone for long. And I guess that is the blessing that Jesus promises here. He's saying, even as I, Jesus, was never alone when I was suffering for the truth, so too will you never be alone, because I will be with you, and I will always be with you. And, and that is the blessing of suffering for God's truth, that God is with you in as real and true and palpable a way, it, with such a powerful sense of presence, that that is enough. When you live what you believe, when the truth that you know is spoken and embodied, enfleshed and acted upon in the world, and that visible expression of truth ends up bringing you grief or persecution, you can know that as real and present as your action is and your truth-telling is, so too God is real and present to you. 
when you live a truthful life and are most fully yourself, by the definition that God has built into you, when you're living God's truth with your words and all of your being and your actions, you are actually living in a place that is closer to, more reflective of, nearer to the echoing voice of God. Truth-telling people are more Christ-like, and in that place, like Christ, can know God, the Heavenly Father, in a more numinous, clear, present, palpable way, what, through whatever persecution place they find themselves in. And there's something in this beatitude about willfully choosing to speak the truth, knowing that that persecution could happen which is where I think this beatitude and the point I'm making right now differs from blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are persecuted for doing the right thing has a sense of intentional action on our part, whereas mourning, yeah, things happen to us and we didn't bring it on us, but here we're choosing to bring it on us to do the tough thing. And again, willfully acting on the truth aligns our wills to God's truth-seeking will. Those moments at a will-to-will -will level of willful alignment are very relationally full places when it comes to God. Even your will will not be alone. God is close to you, that deep inside of you, near unto your soul, Amidst the mysteries of your thought processes and ruminations, the Spirit of God is moving and breathing and hovering over the face of your earth. And that very part of you that is you, Jesus is present and Jesus is saying, you're not alone. In that place that matters most in you, all that is your character, your integrated self, your soul, God is with you. God made all of those places and all of you for communion with him. And what Jesus is saying here is that that sense of yes that you feel in all of those inner places of present yes will be more than enough whenever you're taking the heat. And more than that, it will feel like a blessing, a, a good thing, that blessing. Now, how mysteriously, admittedly, <laughs> wonderful is that? In the toughest, toughest circumstances, knowing that there is a truth that is more than enough as you're engaging persecution because of the truth telling you lived out. And that, Jesus is teaching us, is what life with God is like. That is the life he lived. What a beatitude blessed life is like. You know, thinking back on all of these beatitudes now, when you're feeling poor in spirit and in that completely reliant, small, marginalized, desperate, falling and failing and falling short place, that is where you can know God more. That is especially where an all-powerful, rich God is present. And when you're mourning, giving full expression to, bodily expression to your pain, authentically naming and facing and crying out against your brokenness, knowing God there is what God promises you. And when you're heeding God's call to try to be meek like Jesus was meek, carrying your strength deep within you, not having to show off and show it off and exude sh or exhibit your power in a way that draws inordinate attention to you, knowing God there in the meekness of that place, your, your inner sense of self somehow more fully developed, giving you more uh, of a capacity to know uh, the inner sense of God within you. 
And when you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness, that beatitude, like Jesus did, making all things new, bringing more and more heaven on earth, imagine knowing God there, this beatitude life, experiencing moments when you realize that all that you're, the good that you're doing, um, that God is actually doing it through you, and that you're actually doing it with and alongside God, and actually following God in that good work, knowing his presence in all of those ways. And when you act mercifully, or with a pure heart, or as a peacemaker, and you become God's embodied presence to this world. Imagine knowing God more and more and more there. A sense of presence that is so real and so natural that at points you can't even tell if it's you or God bringing all of that love into the world. I mean, when you find yourself in beatitude places like this, the blessing of God's presence will be so powerful and palpable and real that the pain of whatever persecution you might face will seem negligible and immaterial and, and meh. Because I've got you, Lord, and you've got me, Lord, and I'm not alone. And you're not alone. And you're never alone. And in fact, you are more with God in times of persecution as a result of telling his truth, the almighty God's truth, uh, than you can even begin to imagine. And yes, of course, and it was for Jesus too, the suffering will still be very, very real. But get this, his presence and power and love will be more real and more than enough to the point of actually being a blessing, putting you in a blessed place, a place where God has spoken his word over you and is looking into your face and touching your heart and soul and life and saying, I've got you, and I've got you forever. And so, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for doing the right thing. For theirs, Jesus says, is the kingdom of heaven. Please join me in a prayer. Oh, Lord, to be in that place. It's, it's uh, difficult to imagine, um, especially in the context of suffering or persecution, when everything's bearing down on you, that there is an even greater, more powerful, and instead beautiful presence also bearing down on us, also rising up within us being a wall around us, a protective love that keeps us, an eternal view giver that uh, pulls us into um, a one day perfect heaven on earth, God with us future. That there is all of that <laughs> in a way that is, that is so true that we would, we would call it a blessing. And Lord, to know that that would be, that can be, and that is more than enough, is a deeply compelling thought. And I pray um, for those for whom it isn't a thought, and it's a desperately needed reality right now, that it would become reality right now for them for each and all of us in the times where we need to know your presence in times of persecution, your blessed presence. Um, we pray uh, that you would meet us in that way, in those times, in this time, and ask all these things. In your name, Jesus, 
in the name of the Holy Spirit, and in the name of our Heavenly Father. Amen.
eternal reward not diminish the beauty and the amazing things that are in this life, in this place. Though Church, blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For they, for you, will inherit the kingdom of God. The perfect and endless place of God. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great rest of your week. Take care.